Um, got some pictures from Haiti. Our, our crew is down there, some of our folks, and uh, some other folks from other churches. They're putting the roof on this building. i uh, just leave it right there. Um, that's the, the building. It's uh, just about done. The roof is. I think that's David there in the, in the white hat and the blue shirt, uh, David Miller from here. They got all the trusses up. They got all the metal on except the ridge cap. Uh, they weren't able to get that on. It started raining. So uh, they're having church in it this morning and very, very excited about that. And uh, you guys made that possible. Uh, uh, Pete and Samantha used their money and from their wedding and uh, also our contributions. We got that building up and the roof on and they're working on a house for the deacon that lives there on the property. And we're just excited. So I want to show you those pictures. You can go ahead and go to the next slide now. Thank you. Have a seat, please. If you get your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 11. The title of my message is, Have God Will Travel. I probably went over anyone's head that was maybe 30 years old or younger. How many of you know what I'm talking about with that title? Raise your hand. You're blessed by the Lord. And the rest of you are in trouble. That was an old TV show, right? Have Gun, Will Travel. This has nothing to do with that TV show. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. But if we have God, we're going to find out we're traveling. In fact, our life is a journey. That's, we're on we're a constant motion if we're a child of God. Uh, God never calls his people to sit still in their faith or anything else. We're always in movement when we're with the Lord. And we've been looking at the uh, Hebrews chapter 11, the, the people of faith. And if we've been talking about the faith that... The fact that faith is the bridge that brings us from the natural to the supernatural. The faith is being assured of the things we've hoped for and the evidence and conviction that we're convinced of things that we haven't seen. And we've been talking about that and we've been talking about the fact that faith is a verb. It's not a noun. Not when you talk about it in God's terms. That if we have faith, it means we trust. And if we trust what God has told us to do, we do it. There's an action involved with faith. And we see that throughout. We've looked at Noah, we've looked at uh, Enoch, we've looked at Adam and, and Cain and Abel and all these, these people of faith. And today we're going to look at Abraham. In fact, our denomination's uh, former name was Church of God of the Abrahamic Faith, which means we believed in Abraham Lincoln. And uh, no, I do believe in Abraham Lincoln, by the way. I believe he existed, had a really cool hat. Anyway, that's not the Abraham we are talking about. We're talking about the Abraham of the Old Testament that God called to begin to be the father of the nation that he would call his own. To, to use our language, Abraham started the church. Now, I, I find this intriguing, and I, for, for a couple of reasons I want to share it this morning. God creates Adam and Eve, and he puts them in the garden doesn't go very well. They get kicked out. And, um, and then the world begins to multiply and populate and, and things progressively get worse. But God started this world with his people and, and his relationship with them. But what intrigues me is he did not start his church, if we can use that word because it's what we understand, his people, for 2,000 years. You, you understand that? For 2,000 years there wasn't a church as we would think of it. It wasn't a, a select group of people that were following the Lord. It was more of a relationship. God just had a relationship with his people. And it's one thing that's always been deep in my heart as a, as a pastor is that church is supposed to be family, not a business. That as, as a church, our function should be, we should function as a family. Where we sit and we talk and we work things out. If there's an issue and we've got decisions to make, we sit and talk about them like a family would. And, and we work them out. It's a relational thing and relationship between us and also relationship between God. And, and not only is it intriguing to me that there was no church, as it were, for 2,000 years of human history, there was no Bible either. There was no written word of God, no law, no commandments for another 600 years after he started the church, his people. It'd be almost 600 years or more after Abraham was called from where he lived to go to what is now Israel 
to begin the nation of God, that it would be another 600 years before he would give them a textbook so that they would know what he wanted. I don't know what all that means. I just find it interesting. That it was to be a relational. That we were supposed to be in a relationship with him, but it wasn't going very well. And uh, a lot of issues came up, and, and they needed some instruction, and the word of God came. And so he gave it to Moses, and he came down the mountain. And that didn't work very well either, first time around. Uh, but that's a different sermon. I want you to look at me at the beginning of, this, of, of the church, of his people. In, in Hebrews 11, it talks about that beginning. Uh, Hebrews 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he, has, which he was to receive for an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By the way, that happens to me a lot. Well, yesterday evening at a conference, I start this quick walk down the hall and I get back there and I thought, oh, what am I doing back here? <laughs> well, <laughs> you're young, you don't know that, Caesar. He'll come. <clears throat> he, went, he went to a place he didn't know where he was going. <laughs> a lot like my wife. Um, and that's not nice. She's not here to defend herself. My, my wife and I, and she jokes about it too, we have this code. She, she, she's bad with directions. She is great with a lot of things. Directions isn't one of them. And so she's called me many times. I can't, where am I at and how do I get? And so I said, if you can't get a hold of me, here's what you do. You sit at the intersection and you look and think about what it was. And then I said, just with your best intuition, you make a decision, and then you go the other way. <laughs> and so, uh, if any of you tell her I said that publicly, you're in trouble. Um, Abraham gets sent by God to go somewhere he doesn't know. But notice what it says, by faith, verse 8, Abraham, when he was called, called by God, right? God says, I want you to get up and go from here in the Ur of the Chaldees, and I want you to go to a place that I'm going to show you. He didn't tell him where it was. And it says, by faith, he obeyed. Now again, faith and trust is not just something up here. Like, well, I, I believe I heard God's voice, and he told me that I need to leave here and go somewhere else. I believe it. That doesn't do any good if you not pack up your stuff and start walking. If you're with God, you're going to travel. I don't mean necessarily travel. But you're going to be moving in your life towards what God needs and wants. You know, this is where faith and trust is hard. What if he does want you to travel? How many of you were born in Clark County and have lived in Clark County your whole life? See, I don't know what that's like. There's a part of me that really, really envies that. I was a preacher's kid, and back when my dad started out, you moved every three to five years or something like that. I lived all I thought it was normal that you saw your grandparents once or twice a year. I thought that was what everybody did. And, uh, you know, it's just people who, who have lived in the same house. For, has anybody lived pretty much in the same house their whole life, born and and raised a few of you, okay, a few, okay, uh, same room, <laughs> I don't know what to do with that, uh, the, uh, you got me off track, John, you're awake though, that's good, <laughs> it is a first, we've witnessed a miracle amongst us this morning, um, there, there's part of me that just, just envies that because I, I, I didn't have that. And that's one thing I talked to God about when I, when I went in the ministry. I said, Lord, if there's any way, uh, we get some feedback up here. Can you just shut the monitors off maybe or turn them all down? I don't know if that's it or not. Something's buzzing and I'm a little ADD sometimes and makes me eh, eh, squirrel. Anyway, uh, 
this desire to, to stay home, how hard that is. And I, I wonder if God called you to leave here, those of you who've been here forever, and he wanted you to go somewhere else and do something else, and you were convinced it was him, would you do it? That's tough, isn't it? That's tough. And yet, I've said it a million times from this pulpit, if you believe God is asking you to do it, you will never be satisfied unless you do. We're always moving if we're the Lord. We're always in a progression. And, and, and in this life, we're never where we want to be, and, but we're not also where we don't want to be. And that's what we're going to look at here in just a minute. Hebrews 11, uh, verse 9. By faith, he, being Abraham, lived as an alien. <laughs> nanu, nanu. That's not what he means, right? Is that the right one? Nana, nana. Oh, whatever you did, that worked. Praise the Lord. Blessings to you up there. I'm not talking to the Lord, by the way, when I look up. I'm talking to Nick. Anyway, uh, squirrel. It's one of those days. Just get ready for it. By faith, he lived as an alien. I'm doing nanu, nanos up here. I'm way off track. By faith, he lived as an alien in a land of promises in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise, for he, here it comes, was looking for the city which has foundations whose architect and builder is God. Now here's the crucial part of us when we talk about how do we make our faith real and, and effective. We have to understand that the work and the story that God is doing in this world has very little to do with now. And everything to do with later. And when he's looking for this city that's architect and builder is God, he's talking about the kingdom of God. Revelation 22 uh, says it, it uh, 21 says it comes down out of heaven from God as a bride prepared for uh, a groom. And so it, this kingdom of God that is coming that he's going to establish on this earth, he's looking for that city. And if you jump down to verse 13 of Hebrews 11, it says, all these died in faith without receiving the promises. All these died in faith, still living that faith. But they didn't receive what was promised. That's sermon we'll do later, but they didn't get it. Abraham would spend his whole life looking for a land that he would never have. Because what it was really about was not the chunk of Israel that we now know as Israel. That's not what the real picture of God was about. It was about establishing a group of people, a church that would bring about the Messiah, that would redeem the world, and not just inherit a chunk of land in the Middle East, but the whole earth would be theirs. And it says, because of that, he lived as an alien in the land of promise. Now, he did live there. He did make it to Israel. He does live in the land of Israel, but he never really possesses it. I want you to, to go backwards from where you're at in Hebrews right now. I want you to go back in the book of Acts, uh, chapter 7. And we're going to go back to Genesis here in a minute uh, and look at the original account of when, he, when God calls him. But while we're up here in the New Testament, uh, we'll, we'll take some time in Acts chapter 7, where Stephen uh, begins to talk about Abraham and, and shares and sheds some light. Um, Acts chapter 7, verse 2 uh, Stephen begins the sermon. By the way, Stephen only got one sermon. You know it's really hit the nail on the head when they kill you after your first sermon. <laughs> Most people just sleep during my first one. But anyway, he says in verse 2, Hear me, brethren and fathers, the, good, the God of glory appeared to our father, and that's what they consider Abraham, our father Abraham, when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. And he said to him, leave your country and your relatives and come into a land that I will show you. Then he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. From there after this, after his father had died, God removed him into his country in which you are now living, meaning the land of Israel. Look at verse 5 though. But he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot of ground. And yet, even when he had no child, he promised that he would give to him a possession as a possession his descendants after him. 
So he finally gets to what we now call Israel, which would be the land of promise. And Stephen tells us that he never owned even a square foot in Israel. He just was passing through, which is what we are. And we travel when we're with God in, in the spiritual realm. And it says, that, but even though he didn't own any land in his lifetime, he told him that he would have kids and his descendants would have this forever. We don't have time to look at all the promises in Genesis where he says, I'll give this land as far as you can see, north, south, east, and west. I'll give it to you and your descendants as an everlasting possession, the kingdom on earth. That's what he promised him, even though he would never have it. And he was 75 when he left. And God promises him when he gets there, I'm going to have a kid. And he waits another 25 years. <laughs> oh. Ooh. I'm all right. I just had a moment. And uh, 100 years old, and he has his first kid. <sighs> My granddaughter is living in our house, and I'm 53. And I'm thinking... Oh, my Lord, I'm glad I'm not the one doing this for real. <sighs> you want to talk about faith? Someone who trusts God, not only does he have to move, but he's got to start having kids at 100. Oh, my. Anyway, I digress. He never had any promise. None ever hold the land, but he said, you and your kids are going to have it forever. And so he went. Now, I want you to go back to Genesis chapter 12 with me, and I want you to look at the original account. We find something um, that I think is interesting. Genesis, way back, beginning, very first chapter, first, not chapter, very first book, the 12th chapter. Genesis 12. This is when God calls Abram. Now, as you're turning there, I want to set the stage. As I said, it's 2,000 years since Adam to Abraham. Why did God wait 2,000 years to start his church? It's because up until then, for the most part, there was some relationship going on, and the people were walking with the Lord in some semblance of that, and there really wasn't need, I don't think, for the structure. But if you were to take the time and look at Genesis chapter 11, you find out that Nimrod led the world astray, and they built the Tower of Babel. Basically started concept of humanism that you know in and of ourselves kind of we're God and and they tried to build this tower to heaven and and that's when God confounded the nations as it were and dispersed them gave them different languages and and there was this rebellion for for lack of a better word against God and and it was time as this the nations were spread out and now that they had different tongues and languages and different faiths and beliefs that it was time for someone who still had a relationship with God to be called out, that he could use as his moniker to the world, that, that this is people will, will be in covenant with me and you will see how I act by how they get blessed. And that's what we're going to see here in a minute. And so it's through the, the working of God through a people who wanted to work with him versus a, a world that was not, God was going to show his grace and his glory. And so 2,000 years later, and the Tower of Babel takes place, and then he calls Abraham out, verse 1 of chapter 12 of Genesis. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the ones who curse you I will curse, and in you... All the families of the earth will be blessed. There's just no way to get all that I'd like to talk about today about this, but that promise at the end of verse 3 is a promise of Jesus. In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And we know, as we were, if we were to take the time, that it's through Abraham, who had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. Jacob becomes changes his name, God changes his name to Israel. He has 12 sons, become the 12 tribes of Israel. And from the tribe of one of those, Judah, the birth of the Messiah comes through this family that God calls when it's just Abraham and, and a small group. Through Abraham and his kids, at 100 years old, uh, would come Messiah. 
And of course we know, those of us who know him, that through Jesus we have all been blessed. And he says, so in, in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now I, I, I kind of joke about this and went over quickly. Understand the faith it takes. 75 just moving. And I don't mean like moving across town. I mean just getting out of your chair and moving. <laughs> Difficult. Let alone packing up and moving. And then to tell them, oh, by the way, you're going to start having a family too. This was a huge step on Abraham's part. But he believed God. And belief wasn't just something in his head. It was an action. It was, it was a process. And it involved the travel. And he did it. And he, he picked up his stuff and he went. And he and his dad started the trip, and they got as far as Haran, and they stayed there for five years. And then his dad dies, and God said, this isn't where I wanted you to be. That We can read this all in the end of chapter 11 if you want. But he said, it's time to move on. This is not the land. Haran isn't the land. And he finally got him down there. So verse 4, and by the way, it says Abram instead of Abraham. And that's because that was his name originally. It wasn't until he had a child that he called him Abraham, which means the father of many. And so his name is Abram here. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, and all their possessions which they had accumulated and the persons which they had acquired in Haran. He didn't buy people, by the way. This is servants and, you know, husbands and wives, just his family group. And they set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. And Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the oak of Morah. Now the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, To your descendants I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Then he proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar of the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abraham journeyed on and continuing toward the Negev. The journey was never going to stop for Abram. Now, it's interesting to me that since there's, whenever I see extra detail in there, there's probably a reason for it. And it says that he got, you know, to Shechem, but then he moved on and he, he ended up between two cities, between Bethel and Ai. And a little shout-out reminder to the Ross family, if you happen to be watching on YouTube or whatever. Kent Ross, uh, if you didn't know Kent Ross, he, wa he was a big man. And he had a big presence and a booming voice. And he was one of those guys that took his glasses off when he preached. And you knew the moment was coming. And uh, one of his famous sermons, he was an incredible preacher. He was our teacher when I was at Bible college, was Bethel. And AI. I don't know what he talked about, but I do remember the battle <laughs> and the AI. No, I know what he's talking about. What I'm going to talk about with you. I remember his sermon and, you know, these, these big hands and he was talking about they had Bethel on one side and AI on the other and there's a decision to be made. And, and, and there's a lot of people who've tried to make analogies from this. And by the word, the way the name Bethel means the house of God. So on one side you had the house of God. On the other side, you had a city named Ai, which means a heap of ruins. So there's destruction over here, or there's the house of God over here, and Abraham pitches his tent between Bethel and Ai. I can't say it like Kent did. I don't have the full beard like he did. What's the point? Why would God put that in there? And, and here's, I wrestled with this this week of what... What's going on here? And it's, it, what intrigues me is if, if this is called Bethel, and this is called, meaning the house of God, and this is called a place of ruin and a heap of ruins, why not, why can't between, why not just go to the house of God? And here's the interesting thing. When Abraham gets in between these two cities, this isn't called Bethel yet. This is called Luz, L-U-Z. There's a name for your next kid. Um, it was called Luz. In fact, it would not be called Bethel until about a couple hundred years later when his grandson, Jacob, would talk to the Lord there and have the dream. And he would come back and he'd make sacrifice there and he would call it then the house of the Lord. So it wasn't the house of the Lord yet. 
And so it wasn't like, this is where God dwells. Why am I parked in the middle? I need to go over there. It's just, it's a, I think it's an illustration of, of what Abraham was all about. He was in between the ruin and the kingdom. The ruin and what would be the house of God. And he was camped out in the middle. Which is exactly where you and I live. As one man put it, we live in between the trees. Between the Garden of Eden tree and the tree in Revelation uh, 22 at the end where it says again, oh, the tree of life will be there. We're living between the trees. It wasn't like he had a choice to go to the house of God. It wasn't that yet. But what did he do when he lived between he doesn't want to go back to ruin. He doesn't want to go back to the destruction that Nimrod had started. He left that, and he was being called by God towards the house of God, but the house of God hadn't come yet. Remember, he was looking for a city, an architect whose builder is God, and it hadn't come yet. And so he camps in between, and what does he do? He builds an altar to the Lord there, and he called upon the name of the Lord. One lady called it, you need to bloom where you're planted. He doesn't want to go back home because God says, if you stay there, I'm not going to bless you. I'm going to bring you to a place, and we're going to start the work there, but even that, you're not going to have possession in it yourself. You're just going to be sitting in the middle, kind of looking towards Bethel, that one day I get the house of God. One day I get the city whose architect and builder is God, but that's not where I'm at right now. I'm here, and so while I'm here, in between these extremes, I'm going to build an altar, and I'm going to worship. Every one of us in this room are between Bethel and Ai. We're looking for something better than what this world can offer, and we certainly don't want to go back to what has been. So what do we do? Wherever we are, we build ourselves an altar and we worship the Lord there and call upon his name. And God would direct him. Eventually he would get down to Egypt for a while and he'd come back and the story would just continue. God promised Abraham that he would have kids. That's next week, by the way. We're going to talk about the process of him uh, getting a child at 100 years old and then what God would ask him to do with that child some 15, 16 years later and the faith that all that took. We'll, we'll address that next week. But he promised him that even at 75 and then 100 years old, there would be a great nation that came from him and that the whole world would get blessed from him and eventually all the land, even the land that he left from, would become part of the uh, eternal kingdom of God, but he had to wait. Now I want you to go back to New Testament. I want you to look at one more thing with me. Go back to New Testament, to Galatians chapter 3. What about us in this story? Galatians chapter 3. If the kingdom is promised to Abraham and his kids, do we have to make sure our lineage is connected back to Abraham if we're going to have this inheritance. And Paul talks about that to the church of Galatia. And here's what he says, Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3, I'll give you a minute, verse 26. For you are all sons of God. You're all sons of God. How? Through faith in Christ Jesus. Again, as I know some still turn there, the whole reason Hebrews 11 is written, by the way, it's called Hebrews, written to Jews. The Jews along the line somewhere got confused that the God was a God who saved people by what they did and by their works. And so he's writing to say, even what you thought were works or were saving people was really faith. By faith, Abraham left. By faith, Noah built an ark. It was the fact that they believed God when he said what he was going to do, and then they acted on it. It was the faith, though, that saved him, not the works. We are not saved by our works, but our works often reflect our faith and should. And so verse 26, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, trusting in him. Verse 27, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor 
nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And here it is, verse 29. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants and heirs according to the promise. You and I are grafted in to the promise that was made to Abraham through Jesus Christ. If you are in Christ, been baptized into Christ, you've been clothed with him, therefore you're all sons of God. And if you are in Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. And you are heirs of the promise. And the heir and the inheritance is the whole world. Romans chapter 4. That we would inherit the whole earth. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. And not the earth like this that's cursed. But an earth that is made new and glorious like it was intended to be. So when we read Abraham and the faith that he had to, to leave where he was going and, and to go to a place he didn't know where it was at, and he spent his whole life traveling, that's us. That's, that's our walk of faith. We journey with the Lord and we, we move from one progression to another, whether physically or spiritually. But we're never where we want to be, and we certainly aren't where we used to be. We are in between Bethel and Ai. And wherever you find yourself today, you need to plant the altar Worship the Lord and call on his name. Worship team, if you'd come up, we're going to give you the opportunity to do that very thing. To come to the altar and call on his name. My joke with my dad all the time was, you know, and I'd do something smart out, which was I'm sure very few and far between. He would say, you're out of the will. And I said, oh, you mean I don't get the lazy boy? And he used to have a lazy, an orange one. I love that. And, and he got rid of it. I said, you just got rid of my inheritance. <sighs> the inheritance of father is a lot better than a lazy boy. Um, by the way, my dad said, I never got rid of lazy boy. I got you. Anyway. But the inheritance from father was... That was mean. He didn't say that to me. The inheritance from father is the world and eternal life. A world without sickness and sorrow. No more crying, no more pain. No more diabetes, no more cancer. No more things that put people in the hospital than put them in the ground. All that will be done. Through Christ, you have a hope of that. You just need to lay down your crowns and fall at the feet of Jesus. Call out to him and he will save you. That's the song we're going to sing. We fall down, we lay our crowns. Stand and sing with me if you would. Father, we thank you that um, even though we're not where we want to be in the eternal life of your kingdom, we are certainly not where we used to be if we know your son. We've been taken from death to life, and as Colossians has been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Father, may we spread that to a world. Father, we thank you for being here today, and may we be challenged today to be like Abraham, no matter where we are, that we put our altar down. We worship you and we call on your name. And we go when you tell us to go. Father, we pray this all in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen.